Hi, welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Shannon Elliott. Wellness Recovery Action Planning, or RAP, is a self-management recovery system that helps people around the world struggling with mental health issues. Today, I'm joined by two individuals who are instrumental to the development and growth of RAP. Dr. Mary Ellen Copeland is the author of the book Wellness Recovery Action Plan. RAP has helped her achieve long-term wellness after years of experiencing mental health challenges. Her work has changed the mental health field as she has advocated that people with mental health issues can have hope and recover. Matthew Federici is the Executive Director of the Copeland Center, a Vermont-based organization that promotes wellness and empowerment through education, training, and research. He's an advanced level mental health recovery educator and RAP facilitator. Welcome Mary Ellen and welcome Matthew. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Mary Ellen, can you tell us what RAP is and what its purpose is? RAP is a system that was devised by a group of people who have mental health challenges, 30 people that I had been working with, teaching them recovery skills and strategies. Um, it's, a, it's a very simple system um, for or figuring out what your resources are, what are the things that you have that you can use uh, to help yourself feel better and help yourself stay well, and then organizing them into a group of plans, um, a daily maintenance plan, what are the things you need to do every single day to stay as well as possible, which of those resources do you need to use, what are the triggers that might upset you, and then which of those resources could you use to help you feel better if something really upset you? And what are the early warning signs? What are the signs that things are not going well? And just the beginning signs. I used to ignore these signs. Um, things like not buckling in my seatbelt anymore. I don't feel like answering the phone. I don't want to go out. I don't want to talk to people. I kind of feel a little crummy. What are those early signs that most of us ignore? And what are the resources I can use to help myself feel better when those signs come up? because ignoring them often leads to feeling much worse. And then the next section is when things are breaking down. That's when you're really feeling awful. And this is a time when in the past, people would um, end up calling the emergency services, perhaps going to the hospital for a while. And through the development of a, a wellness recovery action plan, they've learned that if they can identify the signs that they're doing, having a really difficult time, that there are resources that they can use themselves, or perhaps reaching out to others, but that they can use so that they can help themselves just get better without um, having to do something that's more intrusive in their life and invasive. Mm -hmm. And then it also includes, in the, in, in the cases that we hope don't happen, a, a crisis plan or advanced directive and a plan for helping yourself get better after you've had a very difficult time crisis. To get so you it really back sounds like well. a very thorough plan to help yourself as opposed to someone else caring for you, Absolutely. making decisions on your behalf. Absolutely. So how was RAP born? Where did the idea come from? Well, the, uh, the originally I did uh, a body of research because I was very concerned that I was losing my life mm -hmm. um, to the mental health issues and challenges in my life. I was having repeated hospitalizations. I was taking a lot of um, medications that were making me feel sicker and sicker instead of feeling better. Mm. And I was very discouraged with that, and I wasn't given much hope by the mental health system. So I reached out to a vocational rehabilitation counselor, and I said, I really want to do research, and I want to find out how people who um, have the same kinds of challenges that I do, how do they get by day to day? That's all I was looking for back then. I wasn't thinking about recovery. If you mentioned recovery back then, people just said, Recovery is not possible. You can't get over these things. Uh -huh. So um, I, I set up a research project with the help of my vocational rehabilitation counselor and um, studied 125 people to find out how they cope and got lots and lots and lots of information and began to put that information together, began using it, began to get better and better myself. and. That was, that was how I, I really got involved in, that, in this work and started writing books and doing trainings. And it was actually at one of those trainings where the people at the training said, you know, this is all good and useful information. It's really good, but we don't know how to organize it into our life. So and that's so, interesting. It seems yeah. like you really had the professional and the personal perspective work together yes. in your own personal recovery. Yeah, right. And so, and so that's when we, we all sat down together and we worked it out and said, this is what we need. This is how we need to organize it. And after we did that, after we came up with this plan, I, 
it, it sounded really good to me, and I took it home and wrote one for myself and started using it, and it was, it was incredible. It made a huge difference in my life, and it continues to. That must have been the best continue. feeling when you realized you finally got it, and you yeah. didn't, it wasn't medication, it wasn't necessarily talking to someone else, right. but it was your rap plan. It that was really my rap plan. You. It was yeah. helping me figure out, what do I need to do every day? Yeah. Suppose somebody is rude to me. What, you know, instead of letting that get worse and worse, right. what am I going to do to help myself feel better? Absolutely. Am, so it's, it's, it's worked well for me, and now it's worked well for lots and lots of people. And we even have um, some bodies of research that have proved that it works for people. Great. So Matthew, how receptive are providers to RAP plans and peer support in general? Well, one of, I think my draw towards, uh, towards this work um, really really evolved from uh, my own experience with um, significant mental health challenges early on and, mm -hmm. and also having an older brother who's had significant challenges. And I, from my experience of knowing uh, about pulling from your inner resources and, and recovery and have the potential of recovery, uh, I went into working as a provider um, in community mental health. And there were a lot of uh, beliefs and practices that uh, seem very inconsistent with what I knew mm. on a practical level. And when I uh, <clears throat> discovered RAP, and in particular, the a lot of initiatives that were beginning where people were making a fundamental shift in how uh, mental health care and mental health support was delivered. And that shift was one that Mary Ellen was ahead of the curve on, and that is that people are the experts on themselves. They know what's working. They they're here today because they are doing things that are working and they know stuff. And nobody was really tapping into what they know and helping those people connect together. Uh, and so this had started to emerge kind of after you began your work uh, on a federal level for community-based mental health uh, services. And these initiatives were focusing on peers, becoming counselors uh, with each other, and uh, a major element to uh, peers being able to coach other peers was learning about what Mary Ellen created with uh, the peers uh, in her area on the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. There, there is often some resistance because uh, I know from my formal academic training this idea that people are experts on themselves, that there are simple, safe, inexpensive things that people can do every day and have significant changes in their life from feeling really isolated, alienated, having a difficult time going down to the mailbox, um, to uh, turning their life around and establishing significant careers as Mary Ellen's mother did um, mm -hmm. with uh, transforming her life from institutionalization to becoming a well-known nutritionist. And this is perplexing to many people who are studying behavioral sciences, studying the mind, um, how this happens. So there are very strong beliefs in the mental health system uh, based on theories that have not really been proven about why people are going through the challenges they're going through, what's causing it, and how to treat it. Um, a lot of expensive and complicated theories and philosophies about this. The reality is that what has been created um, with a group of peers, uh, starting with Mary Ellen's initial inquiries and research on this, is that uh, people who are living with these challenges, coming together and coming up with simple common sense strategies are extremely effective. Isn't it amazing that the common sense strategy is the radical approach? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> really and so this can be very challenging in, in working with systems that have invested a lot um, in um, a, a lot of expensive, a lot of complicated theories and, and techniques to come in and say, really, let's come back down to the simple here. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest challenges, and I know this from my own training, is that um, some of the beliefs about providing supports to people uh, professionally with significant mental health challenges is the concept of professional distance. Mm. Um, and, and really focusing on that this isn't about me as the professional, it's about you, what's wrong with you and how I can help you. And, and the, the real fallacy about this is that relationships are so critical to healing and recovery. And so it, it's not just about you, it's not just about me, it's about us and the relationship that we form. By and large, the system is designed in a way where 
I'm the next expert. I've studied these academic theories and practices and, and um, the science behind what may be wrong with you, and you're here to be fixed. And a lot of people get this constant type of support. The, the challenge about that is that people don't real, you know, they don't learn when they're constantly in relationships like that, that real support in people's lives is always two ways. Right. You get support when you give support. And this is also something that Mary Ellen's work really spoke to when she did her initial inquiry she talked about yeah. and got results back from people that um, one of the key concepts of people who got well and stayed well for longer periods of time is they had support. But that kind of support was one where it was two ways. They had people in their lives they were helping and they were helping themselves. So it can be difficult bringing these Absolutely. concepts into a system, provider system, where it's more one directional. And I can very easily <coughs> see how that level of inequality would not only be, not only make no effect, but actually make things worse because mm -hmm. suddenly you feel smaller than the person who is supposed to be providing you help and mm -hmm. feeding into that own internalized stigma and downward spiral and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mary Ellen, if I, was interested in rap. If I was going through a hard time and I came to my first rap session, what could I expect? Well, if it was the first time this group was meeting, you could expect that you would get a really warm welcome, um, that you would be introduced to the people that were leading the group, and that the group would, would work together at the very beginning to set up um, some guidelines, some group guidelines, so that you could feel really safe there. Lots of times when people go to a group for the first time, it's hard, it's really hard. Sure. Anytime you go to anything the for first the first step, time. Right, yeah. Yeah. And, and so they set up guidelines um, so that you can feel safe and comfortable there, so that you'll know that um, people are not gonna be doing things that, that would make you feel unsafe. And, and then um, they will probably first introduce you to the key concepts of recovery, which are hope, personal responsibility, education, self-advocacy, and support. And those came out of my early research. And so we would have some discussion around those topics. And then people would begin to work together in the group. Um, people, for those key concepts, people would share their own stories um, not the, the the group would be facilitated by a person, but but that person wouldn't be like a <coughs> teacher. The, the, mm. they, it's really based on the premise that people are there to to teach and work with each other. Everyone's on the same level. Every everyone's on the same level. Absolutely, it's non-hierarchical. Everybody's on the same level, and that they would would work together, and that everyone would have chance to share their own stories of hope, and how they learn to be personally responsible and talk about education and self-advocacy and, and, and have ongoing probably discussions about support, which is huge. And, and then from there, they would start um, talking about the, the facilitator would describe the wellness toolbox, and then people would start sharing what are the wellness tools that they, you have, and each person would share the ones that they could think of, and you have a long period of time when people just list their wellness tools and usually they have some newsprint pads they jot them all down and hang them around on the wall so that everybody can see them and everybody's getting ideas from each other. So what are some examples of wellness tools? Um, well, um, one of the wells, wellness tools I use a lot is listening to music, mm -hmm. uh, is playing the piano, it may be just taking a few deep breaths, it may be changing what I'm thinking about to something positive, um, focusing on positive things, positive affirmations, um, I have a list of over 80 of these. So I keep very simple things to do when you're in a moment that you need some positivity. Right, and they can be things like, it can be things I need to do every day, like drinking eight glasses of water a day, avoiding sugar, having three meals um, a day, maybe whatever that is for a person, whatever they're kind of like working on. I need to be sure that every day I have plenty of vegetables. So I have, okay, on my daily maintenance, it's seven servings of vegetables a day. And so it might be different on somebody else's. It might be be altogether. So no two different rap plans are like because things. they're customized yeah. to the individual. They are absolutely. You you write it for yourself. Some people might write on theirs that they need to take a shower every day. I don't have to write that because I've been taking a shower every day for years. And it's not something you you know we're taking. I don't have to put in brushing my teeth. But somebody, you know, somebody who has not done anything to help themselves mm -hmm. for a long time, they're they're. Wellness toolbox could be very simple. It could just be every day I'm going to pull the coverlet up on my bed and I'm going to brush my hair for one minute. Or their wellness tool might be I'm going to smile at one person and that might be it. And that's a starting place. 
it's a starting place for them to take back their life. <coughs> so after they've smiled at one person for a while, then they can talk about and think about what else could I put on my list? You know, so it's I'm, an always I'm changing, good at this. always I'm, evolving yeah, set I'm, of tools. Yeah. Great. So Matthew, can you tell us about your first rap group and what that experience was like? Well, um, as I was saying earlier about uh, kind of my migrating interest into peer support, um, one of the initiatives that was going on in my local area where I was working uh, was bringing uh, this concept of peer counseling and uh, paying peer counselors and making peer people who have had this lived experience uh, a complement to the array of services within uh, the state that I was at the time in Pennsylvania. And um, in, in joining an initiative where we were going to develop this uh, as a formal part of the system where people could talk to somebody at services that have been through um, mental health system themselves. Uh, when I was going through that and we were designing what kinds of training peers should have with each other, uh, I was introduced to the Wellness Recovery Action Plan and uh, went through a workshop with it and found myself um, at a place where uh, there were values and practices that were completely consistent with what I had always believed. Mm -hmm. um, where the, the mentality uh, of the workshop in the group uh, from the group leaders um, was this concept that we were all peers and that we all had an equal stake in wellness that um, you know I, I remember looking at the terms wellness recovery action plan and I've been familiar with other approaches that were similar but they were often designed from uh, a theoretical stance but mm. this was designed from um, practical experiences of people that were talking about what it was they were already doing they were the things that we were doing that worked. And it really hit me that this was quite different because this was about recovering your wellness. It wasn't about focusing on people's illnesses and deficits. And the focus was one in which where anyone in the room had a stake and had an ability to write a plan for themselves. And this was very helpful for me because I had realized that although I had done a lot of these things already in my recovery and um, had really moved away from a very destructive point in my life, I, there was still a lot I needed to do to have a healthier quality of life. And, and so I began to, to uh, really think about where I was in my life and what I really wanted to go after, what wellness really looked like for me. The mentality was that, um, that there were no limits to what people could, be, could achieve uh, in their wellness. There are no limits to recovery. That it was voluntary. Um, that that people who, um, you know, do this, that it was in your power to do it, uh, and you did as much or as little um, as you chose to do. These are fundamentally different ways of relating and engaging people um, about their, their mental health. And uh, it, it was a huge shift. And so it was uh, a no-brainer for me that this was the ideal curriculum uh, to impart for this initiative uh, with peers and in peer counseling. And it really uh, helped me roll out a rather challenging initiative uh, because you know, one of the key concepts of, of Hope, Mary Ellen, has written that you will not benefit from dire predictions about your future. This is not only so important to people who are going through a difficult time, um, but even in the workplace, even at the home front, mm -hmm. just to know that when you're getting these dire predictions about the future, which nobody knows, that you're not gonna benefit from this kind of behavior and that you need hope. Did you find that once you had your own personal rap plan that you had a certain day-to-day -day peace because you knew you had something waiting for you in case you fell on a tough time? If, you know, for me, you know, writing it down was very helpful and then, and then revising it and I, I really found that um, I'd you know, come up with additional strategies um, mm -hmm. that were not in, in the rap plan itself. Uh, so for example, uh, you, know, you can list um, what you look like when you're well and things you need to do every day. Um, then you go into the things that challenge your wellness and then how you respond to those action plans. But I, I was finding so many areas of my life that this was applying that I would create little triangles and asterisks next to things to indicate this was for my marriage, this was for my, you know, um, my own personal record, this was for work. And um, I, I've stopped doing that since I found that just Well, that's proof really, that it works. Yeah, just accepting that it, it, it really is gonna cover a lot of areas of my life. But it was that kind of engagement Right? It, was, it became not just um, using a written plan, looking at it and following it every day, 
but it's just a way of processing every challenge that I encountered in life in a way that was about taking action, about that there were things I can do. So every challenge that, from that point on, every challenge that came into my world, I had a simple structure to take it on. It was actually made it more exciting when challenges came into mm. my life. Because you um, had to tackle them. I had a strategy that was easy to follow that I could at least try. And if it didn't work, I could try again something else. So around the world, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people use RAP and it has helped them immeasurably recover from challenges. What are some of the most moving or memorable stories that you have both heard from people who have used RAP to recover? Well, there's a put one, one particular story that I like to share um, is about somebody who was in that original group where we worked together to develop um, RAP. He had been in the whole eight days we'd gotten together to talk about skills and strategies, and he was, um, he couldn't stay in the room very long. He had to leave often because he got far too agitated, and he had to come with a care provider, and he dressed in very somber clothes, and he pulled his hat down over his face so that you couldn't really see him. But he came to every session, even though it was in winter, and it was cold, mm -hmm. and it was snowy, and it was in a drafty building. Uh, he came every time. And um, after we talked about rap and figured it out, um, I would get calls from um, the mental health agency that he used, and they would say, oh, we're trying to find another rap group for David. David wants to go to another rap group. And so I would do a little research, and we'd find another rap group. And then I didn't hear anything for a while. And I was asked to go to a graduation for a rap group. And when they're in my area, I like to go because sure. it's really fun because people have finished their whole rap plan. And I, I went, um, and this was in the summertime this time, and this man met me at the door, and he was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and shorts, and he was grinning broadly, and he looked me in the eyes, and he said, hi, Mary Ellen. And I knew it was somebody I knew, but I, I couldn't and place he, it. Yeah, yeah, and he said, you don't know who I am, do you? And I said, oh, wow, this is David. And he had been going to rap groups. He got there on his own. He was sitting all the way through it. He was, he was living it. He was living rap. He got his life back from this. Wow. And it was really incredible. And I will never forget him. It was just really That's amazing. really inspiring. So recently, the first annual Rap for Health conference was held in Oakland. Could you tell us a little bit about that, what the goals were, and what some of the highlights were, in your opinion? Um, that was just, yeah, we just, just had that. And I think the, the goal was to um, look at RAP as a tool, not just for mental wellness, but for total wellness, for overall health. And um, I know that, that people are um, thinking about how we can have um, primary care doctors and other kinds of health care providers know about RAP so that they can be um, referring people to, to RAP programs. And so it's, it's really, um, the focus was to move RAP out of the mental health arena where it started and to really cover the whole person, which is what it is anyway, which is you can't separate mental right. health from physical health, from emotional and, and, and spiritual well-being. You can't take all of those things and push them apart. Um, there just is no way to do that. And so um, that's what we talked about at the conference, and, um, and that's, I think, going to be a big focus at peers moving forward. Um, and across the country is about using RAP on a, in a more general way to promote health. Uh, but one of the things that the people in the, who have mental health issues, um, their mortality there is, is 10 years less. Their level of mortality is 10 years less than people in the general population. So we know that this is really an issue that we need to work about whole health with people who have had ongoing mental health challenges. So that's, we're, we're trying to really um, reduce that to, um, so that people have um, long lifespans, just as long lifespans as anyone else. Long quality lifespans too. Yes. Yeah. yes. So Matthew, what does the Copeland Center offer, and why is it important to society, and what do you envision for the future? Well, um, I, I think the most important thing is that when, when Mary Ellen began this work with a, a group of peers, um, that it was constantly being revised and getting input um, from, from others that uh, were sharing their collective wisdom. 
And I think essentially that is the challenge of the Copeland Center, is to carry on that tradition, uh, particularly around this structure of the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, ev again, evolved out of the, the initiative that, that Mary Ellen began was that there were, um, there were effective ways that they looked at in terms of why was this work um, so important? Why was it really catching for people and, and, and moving them? And they developed a core set of, of values and ethics. You heard me talk before about beliefs and practices that people have had in the field. It's what really drew me uh, to RAP and the Copeland Center, where there were these core values and ethics that they had developed that must be upheld when introducing RAP, and is really what makes it distinct um, from a lot of the other things that are out there that are being offered to people. What's really important for the Copeland Center is to, to carry on the mentoring that Mary Ellen began in her workshops, what she has learned, uh, what groups of peers that have worked with her over the years have learned that have created these values and ethics. We have um, close to 200 advanced level facilitators. So. Um, through this whole process of, of dissemination and creating a peer-based environment where people exchange these strategies together, uh, we developed a training model. That training model went under rigorous um, research um, to, to be proven now uh, on the uh, National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices. Uh, Judith Cook was the, one of the primary lead researchers out of the University of Illinois in Chicago that looked at this training model, the people who took the trainings that the Copeland Center has developed um, to, to disseminate and replicate the groups, the early groups that Mary Ellen began. And they showed significant evidence that people had increased quality of life, increased sense of hope. Um, now they're even seeing that people are becoming stronger self-advocates in the doctor's office, um, which is resulting in better care and outcomes for them. Our role uh, is to really maintain those practices of dissemination and, and facilitating groups that are working. Well, thank you so much, Matthew and Mary Ellen, for being here today. It's been an absolute treat, and I cannot wait to see RAP take off even more throughout the country. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For more information on RAP, please visit the Copeland Center website at www.copelandcenter.com. To find a RAP group near you, visit the calendar on the Peers website at peersnet.org calendar. To view videos of the recent RAP for Health conference, visit the Peers website at www.peersnet.org slash videos. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.